Once you make that first cut into the stone, it can't be undone. It sets in motion a series of choices. What used to be a shapeless block of limestone or granite begins its long journey of transformation. And it will never be the same. I'm ready, Father. Draw some out and serve it to the master of the banquet. This is Criteria. Hey, everybody, welcome back to Criteria, and I'm Thomas Miras. I'm here with my friend James Majewski. Hey, everyone. I'm drinking a German beer because my people are from Germany, and uh, James is drinking a Mexican beer because he is from Mexico, which is actually true. I, I did. I lived in Mexico City for a year, yeah. uh, and my brother-in-law is true blue Mexican, so... Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. So, uh, we're here to talk about very, very, very popular television series. Is it television anymore? When are we going to stop calling it television? That's, <laughs> that's what I want to know. stream vision stream vision app series web <laughs> show yeah uh it's it's a web series let's yeah, let's just be no honest. no 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 it's television okay yeah. anyway so uh it's called the chosen uh it is a very interesting series in many ways but but basically it's essentially a, a it's the first multi-season series that's been made about uh based on the gospel about the life of christ and um what we're going to do, because season two, they just finished shooting two or three days ago, and uh, in anticipation of the release of season two, before too long, hopefully, we are going to go back and discuss season one, uh, because we think it's worth discussing on this Catholic film podcast. I'll also mention that on my other show, the Catholic Culture Podcast, I did interview the guy who plays Jesus on The Chosen, Jonathan Rumi, yeah. and I'll link to that in the show notes. That's for, a great for, interview for anyone who hasn't yeah. listened to that yet. But uh, after once we do this discussion of season one, once season two comes out, we'll discuss that as well, and we're hoping to do a couple of interviews on this show with people involved in, in The Chosen as well. Yes. Uh, and we have with us today uh, an old friend of mine who uh, is a chosen mega fan. Uh, he is currently uh, a brother at the, uh, a novice brother at the Philadelphia Oratory. And uh, he's also a filmmaker himself. I met him when he was working, uh, doing film and video for the Dominican Foundation here in New York. And uh, he, he went to Tisch for film, very highly regarded film school. He's also a very gifted painter. I'll link to, to his work in the show notes as well. Uh, Brother Joshua Vargas. Welcome, Josh. Thank you, Thomas. Nice to be here. Hello, James. Um, Josh, how many times have you listened, or sorry, how many times have you watched The Chosen now? Uh, straight through probably three times, and then I've rewatched lots of little bits here and there. Gotcha, gotcha. Nice. Yeah, I've only watched it through once myself, but... Already, my wife and I are missing it, and we've basically decided to start over from the beginning and watch it again. Nice. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I watched it a while back, and I just had my second viewing in the past the past week. Um, and you said you had shown it to a bunch of the other brothers in in the oratory, right, or the other uh, priests, members of the community. Yes. Yeah, well, we're a small community. There's only four of us here, but um, two fathers and one brother, and uh, like you know, myself, they were a little uh, skeptical at first that it would be worth the time, but I, I, I was pushing for a little while. And uh, we started watching it 
and uh, our superior, Father George, uh, he wanted to watch it every night after that until we finished it. Um, and uh, uh, it was, you know, it was a very nice experience for us to, to watch it together as a community. I'd seen it. Um, initially, I began watching it on my own um, when I was in, in Florida for a year prior to coming here. Um, and then I liked it so much, I, I decided to continue watching it with my family uh, as they were releasing the episodes at the time. Um, and so my first kind of full viewing of it was with my family and then we rewatched it. Uh, I rewatched it here with the community here and, um, it was, it was a great experience both times and, um, really gave us all a lot to think about. You mentioned, uh, that the others in the community were a little skeptical. I, I admit that this is why it took me so long to getting around to watching this series. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I had known that I would eventually check it out because it seemed significant, newsworthy, you know, I want to stay abreast of of what's happening in the world of Christian filmmaking. But uh but yeah, I, I have to admit that I was uh I dragged my feet. I think that, you know, there's a bad taste in my mouth left from so many biblical movies or or or, or you know television. Um and then especially, you know, kind of saccharine portrayals yes. of Christ, which, you know, judging a book from its cover at first, I, I kind of thought that that was what this was going to be. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm happy to say that, uh, I was pleasantly surprised both I and my wife at, at what it actually turned out to be, which we'll, we'll get more into, but I don't know, uh, brother Josh, did, did you experience a similar, uh, hesitancy at the outset of this? Oh yeah. I, I mean, I, um, I, I'm pretty critical of, of kind of biblical um, based media. Um, I usually don't really give it very much of my time because I, um, uh, I get I get frustrated very quickly, and especially if it feels sort of cheesy or um, if if it's clear to me that they don't understand the source material, um, uh, which which happens rather often, I think. Um, uh, and then often you get such a kind of a woodenness. Um, they sort of treat it as if they were not making film proper, but if, as if they're doing kind of theater that happens to be filmed, um, which I think is what happens when you do too literal of a rendering and you're just kind of trying to get the, the words on the screen without the proper degree of adaptation and interpretation. I think that's well put. Um, what about you, Thomas? Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I, I have kind of made a point of not keeping abreast of developments in Christian filmmaking for many years. <laughs> I mean, I've never really bothered to check these things out uh, because they're usually just not that good in the past. I think that there's been some positive developments lately. Um, and and I, I watched this series originally because of Brother Joshua, your posts on Facebook raving about it. And then I watched the trailer or I, I watched a trailer, it looked interesting. And then I watched a clip of the scene with uh, the miracle of Peter catching the fish. Mm -hmm. And that's a great scene from the series. And I thought, okay, I, I'm sold on this. So I watched it not too long after that. Um, but, you know, out of the kind of uh, Christian or sort of countercultural film things that I've seen in the past few years, I'm thinking of, you know, on the kind of like the pro-life film uh, circuit, like Gosnell and uh, Unplanned. And then, um, uh, maybe on the more like sort of religious basis, like uh, the Fatima movie that recently we discussed on this podcast. This is by far the most, uh, I think, like genuinely creative mm. in its in its writing mm. um, and and its 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 vision. Yes, you know, I think I think like we've seen a, an overall increase in in the ability of Christians and Catholics to make films with like decent production value, right? But this is one of the first things I've seen. I know you like Paul, Paul Apostle of Christ. I haven't seen that. But for me, this is one of the first things I've seen that I felt really put it to some substantial use, that right. production value in right. terms of actually doing something creative and artistic with the gospel. Right. I think too, uh, I, you know, I'm not going to complain that Christian film is, uh, you know, discovering a higher level of production. But if the sort of artistic integrity of the storytelling can't follow suit, then, you know, it doesn't matter how many filters you put on your lens or like how many drone shots you're going to show me. Like, uh, 
and this is what I think I was most struck by with uh, The Chosen, certainly very well produced, but also obviously done on a budget. So, you know, obviously uh, limited in terms of the kinds of production that they're going to be able to achieve. But all of that is, is, is leveraged to terrific effect and in support of great storytelling. The writing in this series is great. Really well-constructed episodes, uh, a really nice weaving of gospel text with, uh, you know, written uh, original text. Um, I think that sometimes, Brother Josh, you described uh, some gospel adapt- or scriptural adaptations as wooden. You know, I think that sometimes when I see a, 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 a biblical narrative adapted to film, uh, it it all it brings with it the kind of cadence the, that of the gospels that we're familiar with. That's kind of blunt and staccato almost. Mm-hmm. We just watched on this podcast the Gospel According to Matthew by Pasolini, and and that very much. I, I don't know if you've seen that film, but have, uh, yeah. that very much has that kind of right. It has that cadence of the gospels um, that's like very direct. And, um, and this is very fleshed out, but without losing, I think the heart of the gospels. Mm -hmm. So this is all a long way of saying that I think that the writing is really excellent. And so everything else is able to come in and in support of that good performances, good, uh, production design and, uh, and, what you know ends up being a really terrific first season to this series well as you just said i mean even in parts where it's wholly fabricated like episode three when jesus is with the little children little children this is not a scene from the gospel at all um it really never strays that far from christ's words i mean it's often he's the things he's saying are kind of paraphrasing things that he he actually did say elsewhere and things like that. It's all they've 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 stuck pretty close to it without being overly literal. Um, you, you mentioned too um, this being uh, the, the construction of the episodes. This is a really strong point of the series, and I think it speaks to how much they've taken taken seriously that this is a TV series and not a film. So it's uh, they they're clearly going with this. Like I, I'm down to having. Um, I'm totally forgetting the word for it, but the introductory segment for each episode before the credits roll, there's a, there's a technical term that I'm blanking on. Um, but, uh, they, they do all these, they usually begin each episode with a flashback kind of thing to either BC Old Testament era or the, uh, you know, earlier in Jesus's life or something like that. And, uh, that's kind of a classic TV structure, um, where you get this kind of teaser at the beginning and then the episode starts and then the teaser kind of is not necessarily actually part of the plot of the episode, but it resonates with it in some way. And they do a really great job of setting up, you know, like biblical foreshadowings and parallelisms and stuff. And in a sense, if you were to do a, 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 a film or a series just based on one of the Gospels without including some knowledge of the Old Testament or something, it would be an incomplete experience right Right. um of of the gospel but so they've done really well even to include that sort of thing but it happens really um slickly within this kind of classic t modern tv structure Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah i i appreciate um pasolini's gospel according to saint matthew um but it is it's it's such a different piece from this um and this is something that i can appreciate much more wholeheartedly i think that the the reason that um, Pasolini's film sort of works on some level is because it he gives the film time to breathe. It's not sort of just the dialogue and the narrative. There's there's these long sort of pauses of silence, um, and it becomes a kind of a sort of a meditation. Here, um, but you, you what you don't get there is you don't get any real sense of most of the characters. Um, the only character that really has any, any real life in that is our Lord. Um, and, and even then, you know, it's, um, it's, it's an interesting portrayal, but it's very angry. And, and in that sense, it's, it's sort of one dimensional. Um, <laughs> uh, some people find that refreshing. I, I, th- I definitely did when I saw it the first time, cause I was used to these very sort of like, um, uh, 
I don't know, uh, fluffy portrayals, um, or just sort of very ethereal, um, where it didn't feel like Christ had emotions and to see like such a strong emotion. So palpably was, was refreshing, but here we have such a well-rounded portrayal. He has, you know, this range of emotions, uh, and reactions to things. Um, and, and so do the other people around him. And I think, uh, what this show to provide does so well is that it gives a really, um, interesting context to everything that he does. Um, and, uh, and that just really sort of heightens and exalts it all the more because you see it in, in a proper human setting. And I think it's very easy. Um, especially since we have, you know, this, uh, sort of layers of disconnectedness from the gospel narratives, uh, in terms of culture and, you know, all the time that's passed, um, there, there's so much that kind of distances us from, uh, from the time and from the narrative, um, that having a proper sense of the humanity of these people, of the stakes of everything that they were suffering, the fact that they suffered, uh, economic difficulties, they, you know, had to deal with, uh, all sorts of societal pressures that they had to worry about their families, that they had to, um, you know, they had all these sorts of concerns, which were mundane in some ways, very, very like us in some ways, not, um, but that, that adds such a refreshing context to, uh, to this series. And the fact that it is, um, th these episodes and we have time to spend on individual characters is, is really, I think the, the brilliance of it. Yeah. I think that I, I described this to my wife as, it's almost as if it's an education in meditation on the gospels because they do, like you mentioned, brother Josh, such a good job of, of giving this imaginative context to these gospel stories that we're so familiar with. So how they choose to motivate uh, the story behind, you know, the, the encounter Christ's encounter with the woman at the well or how they motivate Peter's first encounter with Christ. Or the wine running out at the wedding. Right. Yeah. You know, these are, these are of course, not, <laughs> you know, so to speak, canonical uh, uh, backstories that they're providing, but certainly are, are rich ground for meditation mm -hmm. and, and, and not the only valid uh imaginative interpretation, if I can call it that, you know, we're, we're all asked to, to enter into the scriptures in this way and to really, you know, place ourselves there and to, uh, fill in the blanks a little bit. You know, I think that this is one of the, the things that the inspired texts of, of the gospel are so, one of the things that's so great about them is, is the, the sparseness of detail and then also the weird inclusion of detail at other moments. Mm -hmm. Right. That's very, potent, you know, it, 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 it conduces to, to, uh, you know, giving you space for, for really entering into this, this text. But, uh, but then, you know, on the other end of this is a film like gospel according to Matthew, which does none of yeah. that contextual work. You know, I, in fact, I think Pasolini, we discussed it on the episode, um, wanted to portray Christ with the 2000 years of distance or, or, mm. or something. Wasn't that like uh, something, something like he that. said, he, he, he said that he wasn't looking for the historical Christ. He was looking for the Christ after 2000 years of worship and veneration and remembrance. And so, so I, you know, I don't know if that's exactly if I'm, if I'm, I'm paraphrasing obviously, but uh, we, we end up getting in that film a much more, uh, yeah, distant or one-sided or parsimonious. Yes, uh, uh, kind of Christ, and I, 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 in some ways, I see the chosen as being like a mm. totally antithetical approach to the approach yeah. taken by Pasolini, and I think it's so interesting that we've watched these in such close proximity. We're, we're doing a film podcast here, but my. The medium I gravitate towards, I haven't really had any shows other than this that I've been into for a while, but um, my, the medium I gravitate towards for storytelling is much more television than film. I mean, I love the opportunity it gives for long-form storytelling for 
for a deeper character studies of a, of a wide range of characters. And I think that that's, yeah, that is really one of the things that is great about this series is the ability to get to know, um, I mean, any number of these characters, Matthew, for instance, you know, we don't, we hardly know anything about him in the gospel other than him being, you know, a tax collector <laughs> and the author of one of the gospels. And, uh, uh, we, we get all this backstory with him and uh, also just, uh, you know, it, I, I'm excited to to see what they do with, you know, characters we even know even less about, you know, like other apostles like Bartholomew or somebody like because all of the, the casting, we haven't met all of the apostles yet. I think we've met about like half of them or so. But but uh, the casting I, I really like and, and uh, the, you do kind of want to get to know some of these characters more that you see towards the end of the season on their on their journey with Jesus. Right. And you just hear a little bit of their banter and kind of sometimes they will make a reflective comment or something. But uh, you don't we haven't gotten the backstories for all of them. Who knows to what degree we will. Um, but it's very it's very interesting to me that um, there's so much space for that. Mm. And some of it if and if they do choose to give some backstory to each apostle, some of it will no doubt be more directly rooted in what we actually know from scripture than others. And some of it will have to be almost wholly imagined. Right. Uh, so I think there's a lot of potential here. I think, I think they're going to be doing like probably like five or six seasons, I think is the idea. I think seven seasons is oh, the yeah? plan. Yep. Okay. I do kind of feel like we're going to see Gaius at yeah. the foot of the cross <laughs> at the end of the series. <laughs> I feel like that's destined and he's a pretty, I, I enjoy his character. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it is. I, I, I've liked that the, I mean, the, the show is obviously sort of imaginative, but I think the, the, the sort of backstories that they've constructed are pretty plausibly imagined based on very specific details that were given. Um, but we're given, you know, these details in passing mention in the Gospels, and they've constructed, you know, all this stuff around them. Um, and, and that's one of the things that's really um, been been sort of satisfying for me to see is that they're paying attention to these things. For instance, I, I think it's in John. Uh, I might be wrong. Uh, but in John, it's mentioned that um, St. Andrew the Apostle and another disciple who's not mentioned, uh, who many have imagined to be John himself, um, were followers of St. John the Baptist early on. Um, but it's interesting, Andrew being the brother of Peter, Peter is not mentioned as being there. So um, the show, I think, seems to, they don't sort of delve into this in any great detail. But you see at one point that Andrew is talking to Peter uh, about who John the Baptist has pointed out. Um, Peter seems to already have made up his mind about John the Baptist. He calls him Creepy John. So, you know, it seems like there's been this history there where Andrew really likes this guy and has been listening to him <laughs> and possibly participating in his movement. And Peter's already dismissed him and doesn't really care very much what he says or who he points out as being the Messiah. Um, I thought that was, and of course, there's there's a couple times in the in the season where they make reference to Peter being a bad runner, which is kind of a, um, a sort of comical moment if you read it in, in John's Gospel, where it says that John and Peter um, are running towards the tomb after St. Mary Magdalene tells them about the resurrection. And it records um, that John got there first, but he said he didn't go in until Peter got there. Uh, so it makes a point of telling you that Peter was a slow runner. <laughs> Um, but there's lots of little things like that where they've picked up on these little details in the gospels That's and sort funny. of fleshed them out yeah. and made them either into points of humor or just, uh, you know, character traits or developed backstories from them. With, with St. Matthew, you can see that his gospel is such, um, it, it's so detailed and it's so interested in sort of looking at how Jesus interacts with these finer points of Jewish law. Um, and I think they sort of took that and tried to think about what sort of a personality would be interested in all of this stuff and would record it the way Matthew did. Um, and that, that was interesting. And they, they made a very interesting choice, um, which I saw from some interviews happened perhaps accidentally, uh, to make his character autistic. Um, and, uh, um, I, I, the, the, uh, actor, I've forgotten his name who plays him, uh, actually apparently had some previous experience in playing, um, characters of that sort. Um, but it's been really interesting to see, um, I mean, it, I think that just would never occur to anyone, uh, to think about something that that's conceived of as such a, um, a, you know, we're aware of right. in, in, 
recent uh, times, but to, to conceive of the fact that there would be autistic people back then and that they, you know, could be involved in these sorts of stories that, that everyone is familiar with these events. Um, that's, that's really sort of been, uh, right. Interesting. But I, I think, um, for a lot of people has given them something to relate to. I think that that's another one of the strengths of this series, um, is that so often it employs casting that's unexpected or almost against type. Um, so for example, well, for example, Matthew, that's, that's a very unexpected portrayal and casting and uh, rendering of this this apostle um, who, you know, in a lot of, uh, you know, say like Renaissance art, we see a bearded wealthy man, you know, but but Matthew is quite young and uh, quite. Uh, he's almost modeled on like uh, the nouveau riche of uh, Silicon Valley. Right, he's, right. Like, he's like more of like a Zuckerberg uh, uh, <laughs> totally. <laughs> or something. Totally. Um, but then also uh, with certain of the Old Testament figures, uh, we get a uh, uh, an intro vignette with Moses, who <laughs> looks nothing like we've ever seen Moses uh, right. portrayed before, um, and 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 then also uh, to a certain degree, uh, our Blessed Mother and Jesus Himself. You know, uh, there's uh, there's a kind of unexpectedness in. Uh, not just the way that they're cast, but the the way that they're p- portrayed, and uh, I think that it speaks to what is probably an overall goal of the series is to really enflesh and incarnate uh, these historical figures, to flesh them out and make them accessible, to make them human, to bring them down from the exalted place of of a Caravaggio painting and into a kind of a more quotidian uh uh sphere so some of the the moments in the series that are most affecting for that reason are the moments that are most human i think thomas you had mentioned to me before i even watched the series you know like the first time we're introduced really to jesus we get to spend time with jesus he's by himself just whittling and starting a fire and and doing these almost mu- these mundane tasks but there's something so rich in contemplating that uh for me too other uh, moments that were really moving were just uh like simple m- m- moments like when Jesus uh and Mary Magdalene go under a tree to just speak about this this Nicodemus character who wants to meet mm-hmm. with him and to figure out like oh yeah who is he yeah, we should set up a meeting. You know, this is something that's not fleshed out in the Gospels themselves, but certainly at some point, Jesus needed to hear about Nicodemus for the first time and then and then discern what to do about this strange Pharisee who wanted to meet with him. And so it's like, it's these moments like that that, that are, are so kind of uh, unremarkable, but but kind of provocative for that reason you know what i'm saying for sure yeah um we we probably i I feel like if we talk about any episode more at length in this discussion it might end up being episode three um because it's such a unique uh episode and it's and it's it's the episode that departs most from what is told in the gospels and also most from kind of the mainstream production style that this series situates itself in um and it but and yet it is very quintessential tv because there's this thing in television which you which which they call a bottle episode and it's usually done because of budget restrictions where they'll just do an episode okay we're just going to do an episode and there's just one location we're just going to use one set and that's pretty much i think there's maybe two sets in this episode um like the field and the the camp and then uh, at, at one point, we're in the little girl's family's home, but I think that's pretty much it. Um, it's this very simple episode. There's really no story told. But what's interesting to me is I, I feel like – I don't know, but it feels less like they wanted to do an artistic experiment, um, which which a bottle episode often provides an opportunity for. I'm thinking of the fly episode of Breaking Bad, for instance. Um and uh, and more that they were just trying to convey something about the gospel and kind of introduce Jesus 
at more length in an unexpected way. I think it was like substance leading style rather than the other way around. That's my impression anyway. So, so that's a very interesting episode just on that, just on that level. Um, but also, yes, the fact that, you know, uh, we, we've only seen really short glimpses of Jesus up until episode three. Right. Um, and then suddenly we get a whole episode with Jesus. Right. And I, and for our listeners who maybe haven't seen the series, episode three is called Jesus Loves the Little Children. I think that's the title of the episode. Yeah. And it's really just Jesus. He spends the whole episode with these little children. He's still camping out on the outskirts of Capernaum. He's not begun to call people to him. And yet these children kind of discover him and are quite enamored with him. And they kind of become the first uh, to hear his his message mm -hmm. and is very very moving as you mentioned Thomas doesn't really have much of a plot it's really just an extended character study almost of Jesus spending time with these little children and these little children spending time with him I like that it doesn't have a plot because it because for these children too it is this them being taken out of their normal lives and kind of just spending time in, in it becomes like this timeless experience almost with Jesus because there's no like action per se. So that, that's kind of interesting too. It's almost like, it's almost like the moments of prayer. Yes. You know, or something, or something like that where, where it is, it is taken. It's not, nothing is necessarily happening, but you know, as we would normally put it, but, um, that's kind of interesting too, is that it's, that's very interesting that that's the first, you know, other than, I guess, Jesus healing Mary Magdalene, you know, maybe one other thing I forget, but um, that's kind of our first real encounter with Jesus and who he is and what he's doing. Yes. You know, yeah. is, is, is not really doing anything. <laughs> he's yeah. just like being, yeah. you know? Yeah. No, it, it was, uh, I thought it was, it was a really um, interesting episode because it, it, it sort of foreshadows Jesus's, um, attitude to children, which we get later on in the Gospels, um, and his disciples try to prevent the children uh, from coming to him. So it, it, it was, uh, I'm sure that's going to sort of come back in a way. And of course, we see two of the kids reintroduced later on um, when they're watching the uh, yeah. uh, Jesus preaching in the house and then later the healing of the paralytic. Um, so it was, I, I was glad that they brought those characters back because then it, it tied it into the rest of the show. At the same time, when that episode was going on, I kept sort of waiting for us to, to kind of flash back to <laughs> the other timeline. I was like impatient to see what was going to happen because they had done such a good job of kind of building anticipation um, with St. Mary Magdalene, right. with uh, Peter and Matthew. Um, but, um, but, you know, it, it, was, um, it was interesting. And it, I liked sort of seeing the... Um, Sort of the 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 sense that um, Jesus was imparting his teaching as a rabbi, not just to um, you know there there was sort of no age qualification for that. He could address even the children um, with his teaching, and right. in a sense was using them to sort of prepare others. Um, and that I thought was very clever. Yeah, and I also think that it provides almost the correct hermeneutic with which to view Christ and this this whole story that they're crafting with the chosen. I think that um, the ideal is sort of put forward before we get into the messiness of, of the rest of his public ministry. Mm. And, yeah. and one of the things that it also uh, highlighted for me was what I think is the fundamental childlike quality in Jonathan Rumi's portrayal of Jesus. So maybe we can just talk a little bit about this performance because I think that, you know, everything else good about this series that can be said, it's going to just fall flat on its face if the person playing Jesus isn't able to to, to step up to that, that yeah. kind of impossible task. Just before we do that, if I can just comment on what you just said about the, the children forming kind of the ideal encounter with Jesus. Like, yes. The show explicitly contrasts them with Peter in that ep that moment that you mentioned, Brother Joshua, where they uh, show up 
on the roof of the building and Peter's like, you know, so this guy is like, <laughs> you know who he yeah. is? And and they're like, yeah, we, we already know. And so, and Jesus and Peter is kind of like the chief character who's like, a, like a pain in Jesus's, you know what, like, <laughs> right. you know, uh, throughout, he's just kind of like the one who's getting in the way and like, just like making things more difficult than they need to be and right. like more complicated than they need to be uh, throughout. Like you can see Jesus like restraining his annoyance <laughs> at Peter at various points, which is very, very interesting. Like, yeah, I like that Jonathan Rumi actually portrays that Jesus is like slightly annoyed at, right. certain, at certain moments. Right. <laughs> but, um, but what I was going to say about, about Jonathan Rumi's performance is that it's absolutely amazing. I mean, I, anytime he's on screen, I'm just sitting there with like a stupid grin on my face, just so happy to be watching this. Um, I, I think that, I think that portraying Jesus is something of an impossible task for an actor. I think that you're always going to fall short, that you cannot, I don't know for as much confidence as I have in the the craft I just don't think a perfect personality can be can be adequately portrayed let alone a divine personality um adequately portrayed uh by by uh you know a mere mere mortal um but uh but but certainly sacrifices are made and and things are emphasized. So if in Pasolini's film, we get a portrayal of Jesus that emphasizes his, uh, his, his, you know, zealousness for the kingdom and his, uh, uh, fierceness, um, in challenging, you know, the Pharisees and, and putting forth his teaching. Uh, I think that's what stuck with me the most after watching gospel, according to Matthew, uh, what, what continued to live with me and, and to, to kind of almost bother me in a way, uh, in a good way, um, was this, this, this intensity of the portrayal in that film, but that's done to the exclusion of, of pretty much anything else about, about the figure of, of Christ, right? Here we get, um, a different emphasis. And I, I think that, uh, we can talk more about what, what that emphasis is, emphasis is, but, um, but the first thing I would say is that he's childlike and we see that very clearly in episode three and then it's carried forward through the rest of the season. Uh, he's able to get simply excited about something. So uh, for instance, there's a scene where it's before he goes to meet Nicodemus under cover of night and he's at Peter's house and Andrew comes with a cloak that they've acquired for him and He's just excited to like see the cloak and then go try it on. And, and, and it's such a simple childlike excitement, um, that you also see at the wedding feast at Cana or the way that he jokes around. But he also has this terrific sense of humor. He's always smiling. Um, I, I think that, that of, it's like, of course, Jesus is going to be like a child, right? Um, without thereby being childish she's still a very masculine figure and actually uh, as i'm speaking the sun is coming in here so uh shall we just like pull this table out of the way so that we can yeah we can fix the the sun situation <laughs> this is a uh, one of the one of the dangers of filming in the middle of the day i wanted to ask you were talking about the how jesus is made more accessible in in this film I wanted to ask about kind of a couple of the strategies that they use to do that. And you mentioned him making jokes for the most part. I like this. I like Jesus's sense of humor in the film, uh, the series, but uh, sometimes there's a little bit of like the modern tendency to like, not be able to let like a solemn, like just like sit with a solemn moment. I'm thinking of an, I'm thinking of the example of, I think I know what yeah, example you're thinking the of. The Nicodemus yep. on the rooftop. Yeah. There's a couple of examples, but in particular, particular, there's always a joke right after he heals, heals, he heals someone to lighten the moment. But in this case, I mean, Nicodemus says, I'm standing on holy ground. And then he's like, or holy roof. And it's like, uh, uh you know, so couldn't we have just sat with that? Like, 
solemnity, sure. you know, and that that reverence. Yeah, well, and, and then my other the other thing that they do is Jesus gives a lot of hugs. And I would say like most of the time it works for me, but I didn't think I didn't feel it was appropriate in that moment. It rang false in the moment with Nicodemus. He had just been on his knees for him to raise Nicodemus up may be fine, but I don't know, it just the the hug felt like the wrong uh the wrong thing. And Don and Jonathan Rumi, and nothing in here is a criticize a criticism of his performance, because you know, Jesus I would say, you know, sometimes Jesus should just do that with his eyes, and Johnny Jonathan Rumi can do that and does do that. So sometimes I feel like in maybe in the writing it's a little much to have him hug someone every time. Sure. And then the joke thing is is also Yeah, well I, I have some things to to say about that, but I want to give uh brother Josh a chance to jump in on this. What 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 did you do you have any thoughts on this or on uh Jonathan Rumi's performance in general? I thought his performance was fantastic. It is um I mean for me sort of the bar was Jim Caviezel's performance in The Passion. Um and yeah. I would say that I find this performance as compelling, uh, just as compelling as that one. But of course, he, uh, Jonathan Rumi has had much more of an opportunity to flesh this out, um, to add nuances that, that are not there, because of course, the passion is focusing on one, uh, for the most part, you know, it, it's, it's kind of, um, the tone is, is pretty harrowing throughout. Uh, there's these moments of relief, but um, here we, we have um, much more of an opportunity to explore kind of a range of, of experiences. I, um, I hadn't thought about it in terms of childlikeness. I really like that, um, that observation because I think that that's very um, fitting. And of course, uh, given that, that one of his teachings to the disciples is that they must be like children in order to enter the kingdom, one would expect that he then reflects that himself. So I think that's, that's um, very sensible. It's, I think it's also important with that not to sort of project post-Victorian ideas of what children are like back into uh, Jesus's words. Um, we tend to think of children as being these sort of models of, of innocence and all of that. Um, that's that's very much kind of a late idea. It, it seems like from, from literature of the time, um, there was the idea that children were teachable, that they were malleable. Um, uh, they were, in, in that sense, sort of receptive. Um, and also that there was, there's more simplicity for children. Um, they, they tend to take things, um, you know, in, in a sort of integral way much more easily. Um, and, um, and so returning to episode three, I think that does set up a very good contrast with the apostles, but also kind of shows you where they need to get to. Um, and, um, mm. and how Jesus and the children in, in, on a certain level sort of mirror each other in, in that sort of simplicity that they can communicate right. more easily. There's less kind of resistance. There's less sort of battling and questioning what he's saying. Um, which I think you, you get the kind of the strongest, uh, instance of that sort of, uh, battling and questioning, uh, with the Syrophoenician woman in the last episode, uh, which I think was, was also brilliantly done. Mm -hmm. But I, I'll agree about the episode with Nicodemus. I, th I found that scene for the most part, profoundly moving. I, 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 generally really liked how they Same. how they imagined it how they set the the tone how they um how they lit the scene even um how the dialogue was set up but i did i i thought that same thing about the the joke about standing on the holy roof um it it didn't so much ring that that didn't ring false to me per se but it i would have liked if we could have just sat with the profundity of the moment longer um and then the the, yeah. the one of the few moments that did ring false was actually Jesus's reje rejection of his obeisance when he's kneeling in front of him. Um, yes, especially absolutely. especially since they took the trouble to work in a really interesting um, verse from Scripture at that point, which uh, I had actually never encountered um, as it was rendered there because of a, how it's sometimes translated. But it's uh, the last verse of Psalm two. Um, where it says, kiss the son, lest he be angry with you and you perish on the way. Psalm 2 um, is, is talking wow. extensively about God and his anointed and the sort of conflict between God's anointed, uh, which, you know, in, in sort of uh, perhaps original reading of it is, is referring to, to David and, and you know, the kings in his succession, but ultimately is, of course, speaking about the Messiah. Um, but... Um, Lots of renderings, including the uh, the New American Bible, um, 
Uh, well, actually, I was looking on, on Bible Hub to see how, how different translations render it. Lots of them do render it as kiss the sun. I had never seen it because it's not rendered that way in the RSV or the NAB. Um, and I think a lot of Catholic translations tend to follow the Septuagint's rendering, which I think is also the Vulgate's rendering, where it says something about um, being docile to instruction instead. The Hebrew is really difficult. Um, the huh. I, I actually wrote down what the words were. It says um, nashku bar, um, and people have long kind of struggled over how to translate that or what it means. But they they took that sort of odd translation, which sounds very messianic and is, is I think really powerful the way they inserted that in the scene. Um, but it's unfortunately immediately under, undercut by Jesus saying, "No, don't do that. You don't have to." And you know, and then the hug comes. <laughs> I, I, I right. for the most part, liked the hugs, especially since, um, you know, in a lot of cultures, people are very kind of physically expressive and affectionate, um, including, you know, I'm mm -hmm. Venezuelan, so that's that's mm -hmm. much more familiar to me. Um, and, um, uh, but the, uh, yeah, just in, in that in that moment, I thought that was, um, they, they should have just kind of let us have it. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, uh, that, that, that scene with Nicodemus is amazing and is a, a perfect example of, of what I mentioned at, towards the beginning of the, of this episode, um, of how the writers are able to weave in sort of, uh, text of their own invention with quotes from the gospel narrative itself and, and the Old Testament. Yes. Yeah. And the Old Testament. Right. And so, and it's done very seamlessly, um, and not very clumsily mm -hmm. at all. And in fact, if you came into this not familiar with the gospel story, you might not be able to necessarily catch where they're directly quoting the gospel yeah. and where they're departing from it. Um, but, um, but you know, just like uh, how I think the rendition in, in Pasolini's film of Christ has to make certain sacrifices in order to achieve its emphasis. I think the same is true here that, you know, in emphasizing Christ's humanity, his approachability, his, uh, you know, attractiveness on a human level. They're trying to use a light touch as often as possible and not intimidate people, I think, is part of it. Perhaps, but I think that they also end up uh, de-emphasizing or losing or missing something of his majesty and his mystery. It'll be interesting to see how this is carried forward in future right. um, seasons, you know, especially when we get to places like the Transfiguration or something. Um, and it'll also be interesting to see how how Christ's righteous anger is handled, yeah. you know, toward the Pharisees, calling them hypocrites, or or uh, or obviously in in the temple with the money changers. I think we see uh, uh, in this first season. The potential for that there's tension there's times when christ challenges with his glance or um even in, in episode three with the children they ask uh i think they ask him if he's dangerous or maybe they say to each other like what if he's dangerous and, and he says what does he say he says i'm uh, uh, dangerous maybe to some. some people right so we'll see, you know, how that's how that's yeah. carried forward, right? But, but what I'm hoping is that this starts they've given us like a non intimidating introduction to Jesus. And then as it develops, once people get attached to the character, then they're able to take it, much like how Jesus revealed himself, yes. you know, yes. in an unobtrusive, un you know, uh unprepossessing whatever the that's word right is, manner that's right uh and be able to move it more into you know it's easy it's easy to write it down as okay this is you know jesus is played by a catholic actor but this is an evangelical production so maybe they they're not going to have quite, quite the same level of reverence um uh you know not in a culpable way but just sort of like culturally in there well and i think that the scene with nicodemus is a perfect example because right. As we've already mentioned, you know, Nicodemus gets on his knees, kisses Jesus's hand. And what does Jesus say in this moment? He says, what are you doing? You don't need to do that. And that's just not true. That's just not mm. true. You know, the truth yeah. is, is that he does need to do that. And that's, yeah. and that's true. That's as true because of who Jesus is as it is because of who he is as a creature. And so, mm -hmm. so, yeah. so that ring falls in a very absolute sense, not in like an interpretive yeah. sense, not in like... Uh, like, like, oh, I just didn't like that portrayal. 
It's just not true. He does need to do that. And Christ, Jesus, just, I mean, this is the same man, Jesus Christ, who is at dinner with a Pharisee and a woman uninvited busts in, is weeping and cleaning his feet with her tears and doesn't do anything to stop her, right? So, so don't like let the man kiss the sun, you know? I, 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 I think that the gesture is very moving when Jesus uh, brings Nicodemus up and yes, even when he hugs him. But, but to say, what are you doing? You don't need to do that. Yeah. That struck me as a little evangelical, you know, um, uh, uh, or, or, you know, um, although, although of course they believe we need to worship God, yes, you know, but, yes. but, yeah. but it's more, I think it's, it, it's more about, it's more like the liturgical culture than it is theological in a, in a sense, because, mm-hmm. because, because theologically, of course, they believe that Jesus is God and we all need to kneel before him and worship him. Right. But, but uh, yeah, so, so I think it's more like the, how that's actually embodied. Yeah. Well, and so know. in that sense, it's interesting that it's Nicodemus coming from this very strong liturgical sense who, who right. has that. And I love that subplot. Me too. Nicodemus, Me too. Nicodemus subplot yeah. is great. Yeah. And that leads to another, um, Another uh, point, Joshua, because uh, we were just talking about the use of the Old Testament, and one of the one of the really enjoyable things about this series for for someone who's already you know somewhat familiar, perhaps with the Bible or with the New Testament, is its use of Jewish prayers. And we see, oh, I didn't know that they said uh, the, the verse about a you know uh, uh, like what. Uh, a great wife or whatever uh, before, you know, at Passover, you know, I didn't know that was a part of every Passover. That's really cool. Or, you know, things like that, or the emphasis on the Shema with the children, one of the most moving scenes when, when he has the children say, say the Shema and he's very moved by their simple faith. Um, So uh, I remember one of the first, in that first post that you ever made about the series or the, the first one I saw you post on social media, Josh, about this, that, that encouraged me to watch it. You were commenting on the accuracy of kind of the Jewish setting, the liturgical uh, apparatus and all this stuff. And I kind of wanted to just, I don't know anything about any of that stuff. So I kind of wanted to let, just give you the opportunity to comment on that um, stuff specifically, since it seems like you're somewhat read up on, on, those aspects of Jewish religious life at the time? Well, um, I, I'm not an expert by any means, but I, you know, I, I have, I have read some and I took a, a few courses in the past, um, on those, uh, some of those subjects. Um, what, what impressed me was the, that there was an, a, there was a real attempt to sort of ground this in the, the cultural and religious, um, traditions, uh, that, that, there would have been at the time. Some of, I mean, some of what they're doing is is kind of guesswork because a lot of the sources that we have for say what what liturgical services would have been are a little bit after the fact. Like we we get some from the Mishnah, we get some from the Talmud, which is written much much later. But there's the general understanding that a lot of these things were preserved as oral tradition um, until they were eventually recorded. Like some of the prayers that they use. Um, during the wedding feast, for instance, in the, uh, the wedding of Cana episode, um, those are, those are, you know, recorded, um, pretty, uh, just as, the, as they're being said, blessed are you Lord God of all creation, uh, for you have given us the fruit of the vine, etc. Um, that would have been said at the wedding ceremony and then subsequently throughout the, the seven day celebration that would have followed. Um, I liked that, um, for instance, they, I wasn't really sure how well they were doing this. Um, um, with, uh, in terms of paying attention to the dynamics of, of weddings at the time. But I, I, it seems like there's, there's some room for, for nuance in the historical record. For instance, the, um, uh, Peter's dialogue with, uh, his wife Eden at one point where he talks about how, um, she says how, how relieved he must've been when he, uh, during the, the ceremony, when he saw that she wasn't bald, um, I think that sort of is referencing the fact that this would have been a, a, an arranged marriage more, more likely than not. Um, and, um, and I think there is an attentiveness throughout the show, not perfectly. I mean, the show I think is still sort of playing to American sensibilities in a lot of places. Um, I think that especially that, that sort of egalitarian um, attitude of Jesus to Nicodemus's um, adoration in that moment. That's, that's, 
I, I don't know if I would specifically say that that's a um, coming out of um, uh, a particular denominational uh, predilection, but I think it's it's definitely kind of an American egalitarianism at, at play. Um, and um, but but throughout, um, there is a sense that uh, there's a very strong sense of the importance of family kinship, which is something that you know much as as the church values that, of course, as well, Jesus um, puts at a higher level the kinship uh, of uh, the family of faith, um, you know, the sort of, uh, as sociologists would call the fictive kinship group of Jesus and the apostles. Um, that takes precedence over blood ties. But you see the conflict in the series between those things, the really strong importance of family life and of, um, you know, not just that, but the tribe and the city um, there was a, a strong sense of belonging, that your identity was a collective identity, not individual. Um, and I think we have lived so long in this country with this kind of radical individualism that we take it for granted and we tend to kind of read it back into a lot of these narratives, but that, that in fact was not the way um, people tended to think. So, so, so much of what's happening in these stories is radically new. Um, and, and I think the series does a very good job of capturing that in the excitement of the apostles and their bewilderment and their confusion and the excitement of Jesus, as, as you pointed out, James, um, in, in that sort of line, which then became a, a tagline on their T-shirts, uh, get used to different um, little bit, you know, uh, uh, kind of a. Right. I mean, that can almost kind of sound cliche after you've seen it on, on T-shirts. Uh, it sounds like a kind of a marketing line, but uh, but you know, it it, and it it does communicate something very real, which is that um, I think we are so used to these stories that they can become very mundane. But we we don't. Um, it's very hard to grasp the the tremendous interruption of everyone's lives that that was occurring when Jesus showed up. Mm. Um, Interestingly, I think um, the sort of uh, portrayal that they're giving tends more towards the portrayal of our Lord in St. Luke's gospel. It's not so much Mark's Jesus, which is, you know, very always in a rush and, and sort of cryptic often. And, you know, the first thing he does is an exorcism um, in, in sort of dramatic fashion. Here, there's a lot more sort of... Um, subtlety and attentiveness to to people's feelings and there's a strong emphasis on jesus's compassion and his sympathy um on his concern for women and children uh, and those are all sort of very lucan uh ideas um we get some of the johannine stuff as well um obviously that whole scene with nicodemus um but even then it's he you know they're always sort of weaving in um that that sense of Jesus being very very attuned to and concerned for how people are reacting to him, uh, which I think you see more in Luke than in any of the other Gospels. You mentioned uh, egalitarianism, yeah. and uh, it's uh, it's almost like we don't we can't imagine feeling comfortable with someone doing us homage, you know, even as like a king or right a Pope or something like right, that. Right. So we see the virtue in kind of like immediately like dispelling that kind of thing. That's um, so. Uh, and the idea of like, sort of like, I mean, Jesus is in his person, not just in his office, he is God. So it's different with Jesus, but, we, but we kind of feel like we, we don't have the sense of a, someone just sort of accepting their office office and the reverence due to their office and kind of being, comfortable with that not that you should be comfortable with it per se unless you are god but but uh i think that that maybe that's a little bit of projection projection as you say of this kind of like american egalitarianism like like would even jesus be be comfortable with someone <laughs> kneeling before him or uh or something like that I, I don't know i don't really know what they were thinking with that but but it is kind of it is kind of interesting but i uh, you james you mentioned the woman coming and pouring uh, oil over him and stuff, they're not going to be able to get around that. So they're going to have to deal with that. Right. Right. At some right. point, they're not going to change that scene. Right. To where, right. You know. Yeah. And, and this is this is a strength of this series is that they're tackling really hard source material. You know, these gospel stories, like you mentioned, Brother Josh, are, are so familiar to us. And we have really strong 
ideas about them or opinions or interpretations. And, uh, and some of them are quite bewildering, you know? How do you do Christ's call to, to Peter and Andrew, you know? Like, it, it's, it's hard. I, the, the, the example of the woman of the, at the well is, is a perfect example because you encounter this story in the gospel, and it's, it's quite, um, I, I don't know, yeah, striking and, and strange uh, how quickly things turn right with with almost so little that's said it's but but here in the in the the series they they go right into it they portray it more or less just as it appears in the gospel and yet it's so rooted in a kind of yeah realism and attention to to character we've been given a little bit of background about this 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 woman and 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 it's utterly believable you know, and so I think that that this is this is no small feat. That it, what they're accompli- accomplishing is uh, is is tackling really di- what seems to me to be a really difficult subject. Yeah. The, in the gospel narratives, and so far so good. This first season, they just really hit yeah. it out of the yeah. park. Now, did you either of you? Uh, we don't have to talk about this, but. Just in case, did either of you have any thoughts on their portrayal of Mary while we're on that topic? Yeah, um, uh, I uh, I do have some thoughts, but maybe I'll let Brother Josh uh, jump in first. Um, I I mean, for the most part, I thought it. I thought I I nothing that they did made me sort of unhappy per se. I I I liked aspects of of the portrayal. Um, Maya Morgenstern's portrayal in the fashion still kind of has my my heart in that uh, in that department. Um, I, mm-hmm. I yeah, it seemed like they kind of went out of their way to be a little bit iconoclastic. Like she's the only one that has that kind of like a sideways little head wrap, and she's very kind of spunky in that sense. So I think they were trying to very much kind of go against type of um, the, the sort of classical imagining of Mary, or or any sense of of Mary as sort of regal or majestic. Um, I wish that they had uh, mm-hmm. allowed for that to right. uh, to be an aspect of their portrayal, um, but um, that's not the biggest problem. That's it, you know, it's it's an aesthetic issue. Yeah, um, I don't think it's entirely sure. unimportant, but um, yeah. uh, on the whole, I I I liked the the nuances of her dynamic with Jesus. Um, I, I really liked the way that they connected the um, uh, the episode where she finds him in the temple um, at the age of twelve uh, with with the wedding yes. of Cana. I thought that was brilliantly done. And in fact, it made me wonder if they've read. Uh, there's a book called um, what is it? Uh, the Jesus We Missed by Father Patrick Henry Bearden, who's an uh, Antiochian Orthodox priest, and he sort of connected the stories in a very similar way to how the series did. So I sort of wondered if they read that. Um, but um, there, there was a very uh, well-crafted, I thought, kind of emotional resonance between them. Um, and I, my favorite part about yeah. that episode um, actually was the, uh, uh, not Our Lady, unfortunately, <laughs> um, but was how they, how they used the, uh, the wonderful monologue of the um, cutting of stone uh, that they gave to Jude Thaddeus. Uh, they made him a stone cutter. Oh yeah, I was gonna say that's one of my favorite things too, where they where they uh, show how Jesus speaks to each person in terms of their their craft. I, yeah. I really liked that. But that 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 really. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I no, think it, that, well, just that it, it really sort of um, gave a lot of the weight of that moment that that is, I think, implicit in the exchange between our uh, our Lord and Our Lady in the in John's Gospel. Um. You know, where he says, my hour has not yet come precisely because once he does that, he's on the path to the cross like that, that commences the whole thing. Uh, and there's no turning back from that. Right. But the, the, that monologue just so mm-hmm, beautifully right. um, laid that out with us without having to give us any kind of a clunky exposition where he's saying that explicitly. Um, and I just, uh, I was blown away by that moment. Yeah. Right. And when, when Mary finds Jesus at the temple, when Mary finds Jesus at the temple, um, they could have easily made her 
more clueless mm. than they did based on what's in the gospel yeah. text in that particular scene right. and her not understanding. And said she, but she says, I forget the line, but it's like, I didn't think that this would all. It was too early or something. It's too early for all this, you know? And, and so we see that she actually does understand have a head on her shoulders yeah. and she's uh, kind of understands the scriptures and kind of has some sense, not complete knowledge, but she has some sense of what's coming. So I, I think that that was nice. I don't think that really, in terms of her role, I think that the, what they portrayed was accurate to the gospel. Um, it's more, as you say, kind of the the casting and the the personality. Uh, yeah, that's well, maybe not what we would expect. So I think that in a similar way that that uh, you know, as one aspect to the Blessed Mother is emphasized, another aspect is lost, and so I think we get. Similar to Christ, you know, this very approachable, yeah. uh, very human, uh, very attractive uh, portrayal of, of our Blessed Mother. And, and that's that certainly, I imagine, is capturing something of her, her personality. And her hiddenness. Yes. She's not sitting in the corner quietly to be hidden. She is blending in with everybody else. Right. Exactly. Exactly. But, you know, we don't get any sense of the majesty or the mystery of this, this person and the reserve. Uh, yeah. Well, um, you know, a similar, I, I similarly think that the, the bar was set with the passion in terms of portrayals of either of Christ or of the blessed mother. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm glad that, uh, that with these portrayals, I think they're, they're stepping up to the plate, but I think that something is, is, is lost in the mix and and it'll be interesting to see if that's recovered in later seasons but um but with with the blessed mother uh in that that sequence in uh in Jerusalem finding our lord at the temple you know the first thing we see of her is her basically panicking in the streets and i just don't know that our blessed mother would have been panicking as she fran or been frantic as she searched for our lord mm. i'm certain she worried i'm certain she suffered but I'm also certain that she trusted. And, and so, so, you know, like, you know, it's, it might seem like a, a, a squibbling, you know, but, but I think similar to the moment with Nicodemus, I think it's, it's a consequence of a kind of overlooking of this, this more mysterious part of, of, of who, who our blessed mother is and was. Mm -hmm. I, I'm certain that that something of our Blessed Mother's uh, experience of the crucifixion would have been prefigured in her experience of those three days searching for Jesus, uh -huh. you know? And and in, in The Chosen, right, when, when we see our Blessed Mother searching for him, is this the same person we can see? standing um, yeah. at the foot of the cross. You know, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm just asking that question. Yeah. But like, yeah. Of course she did gain understanding. Yes. Right. In between those times. But, yes. But yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So my, my roommate, Anthony observes these things. I watched a few episodes with him. He pointed out there's a lot of diversity in the, uh, among the Jewish population of Capernaum, <laughs> right. uh, or maybe they're not all Jewish, but, but um, the, the sort of general townspeople, uh, including people who are clearly like sub-Saharan African. And he pointed out uh, you'd actually be more likely to see sub-Saharan Africans in the Roman Legion. Yeah. and But the Roman Legion are all solidly super white. <laughs> and I don't think that this is a deliberate choice on the part of the filmmakers. I think this is them just accepting a convention that, okay, well, they're imperialists and colonialists, so therefore they are – American or British, yeah. essentially. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> it's not a big deal, but it's worth pointing mm -hmm. out. Like, actually, probably the Roman Legion would have been more diverse yeah. than the uh, yeah. the Jewish population right. in Capernaum. But it's just kind of a funny uh, observation that he. Yeah, had. that is that is interesting. I mean, there is such a clear kind of timeline in the Gospels that Jesus is is exclusive, exclusively initially ministering to Jews. Uh, to the people of, of you know the kingdom of Judah, um, and um, when he 
steps sort of outside of those bounds, it's always a big deal. Um, so, you know, the, the Ethiopian woman, for instance, and, and presumably either her family or her friends who also, you know, they kind of dress them distinctly. So they're making a statement about where they're coming from culturally. It's unclear whether they are meant to also be Jewish, you know, whether they're Ethiopian Jews that are just happening to live in Capernaum or, or you know, uh, in Galilee. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so that's that's not really clear what they were aiming to do there. I, I, I don't think it's not a huge deal, I think. Um, but it, I, I kind of took it as them sort of trying to do some of, of what's become common now with kind of colorblind casting in historical um some historical films and, and television shows, but trying to then add a further layer of plausibility by giving them a, a cultural identity that would have made some sense. Um, but I, I don't know. So I think we should probably go ahead and, and start to wrap up unless yeah. anybody has any sort of final comments that they'd, they'd like to make uh, about the show. Any, any glaring topics that we didn't discuss yet? We haven't talked about candles. Okay. There's a lot of candles. What do you want to say about candles, Josh? In the, in the series. We have nothing to that say about like, candles. So that, was, to you. <laughs> that was like the one the one thing that really bothered me that I hope they, they fix in the in subsequent um, seasons is that they, they have candles everywhere, which would not have been in common use at the time. They also have oil hmm. lamps. Um, but there's a lot of candles. Uh, and I assume that that was partly done for like a budgetary reason and they're cheaper than, you know, trying to purchase endless oil lamps and filling them all the time. Um, but it just, it, it, for me, it was like the one thing that was really distracting the whole time. Huh. Um, that and, and, uh, uh, the, the one other one, which I thought was actually a little bit funny was they have the exorcism scene, with Nicodemus and, and Mary Magdalene. And uh, it was they clearly did their research because there there's sort of a range of different exorcistic techniques that would have been in use at the time, including the use of certain substances that were um, uh, supposed to be unpleasant to the uh, to the demon and would have driven them out. Um, often they would be burned. We see this in the Book of Tobit. Um, uh, the use of certain uh, you could say formulas that invoked uh, sort of higher spiritual powers um above the demon to drive them out um and then the the holiness of the exorcist himself which usually would have been a rabbi um in a in a jewish context in a greek context it was more likely to be a physician but they have him go in and he's using a byzantine thurible with bells on it uh, which i thought was so funny uh, uh, of course you know someone who has not been to divine liturgy wouldn't recognize that but it was just such a little uh, <laughs> uh, strange anachronism well, before we wrap up, I if I would like if we could just do a little round of just saying what your favorite moment of this first uh, hmm. season was. Um, maybe I'll I'll begin with you, brother Josh, since you've seen it more than either of us have. But can you identify like one moment in particular that is your your favorite moment of the the season so far, the series so far? Um, oddly enough, I think it might be. The, the the introduction of Jesus in the series in episode at the end of episode one when he encounters Mary Magdalene and heals her and I I cried <laughs> when that scene when I saw that scene the first time I thought thought it was so powerful um, her reaction and the brilliant use of that verse from Isaiah that that of course is is so crucial in her life and and the, the way he recited it to her it just uh, so so powerfully done I thought. Um, and, and really sort of sets up, um, all of the other scenes of healing that we get later on, but, but lends a lot of weight, um, I think to her experience. And, um, and of course we see so much of what happens later through her eyes. Uh, uh, that, that, that scene I think has to be my favorite. Yeah. What about you, Thomas? Uh, I'm going to say two. Um, the one that I keep mentioning is the scene where in episode three, where Jesus has the children say the Shema and just his reaction to that. Yeah. It's very beautiful. I also am particularly fond of the sequence of events in the scene uh, 
where Jesus heals the paralytic. Mm. There's so much going on yes. at that moment. We're seeing so many different people's reactions and immediately, it's not giving us a lot of time to rest. I mean, immediately we're seeing the Pharisees reaction. We're seeing his mental comment and Jesus's recognition of that. And uh, that's also where we see Jesus being the most stern. I couldn't help think of, of uh, Michael Pakalik's translation of the Gospel of Mark, where he mentions in his notes that the literal, I forget, I can't remember the verse he's re- referring to, but the literal uh, translation is, meaning of the word is that Jesus like flared his nostrils or something. Uh-huh. And and, and uh, Jonathan Rumi has some like good like, Middle Eastern nostril action going on there when he's telling them when he's like, when he's like proving himself to them, yeah. you know. Uh, so it's uh, I I just particularly like that scene because I you know I'm hoping you know you were mentioning Jesus is more stern side and I think yeah. that's the most we get of that probably in this series. So it was nice to see that in this season. Yeah, well, I think that. For me, my my favorite moment in the series is uh, well, I guess I'll I'll mention too. Also, I I was so heartbroken with Nicodemus's choice not to follow. Oh yeah, making Nicodemus like the rich young man. Yeah, was really interesting. Yeah, so that that was like, you know, I didn't expect that I was going to be so invested in this character. Uh, when you know encountering him in the gospels i'm not you're not particularly invested in what happens with nicodemus mm-hmm. but here it was just very very difficult and and also you know a, a challenge personally to to think about you know christ's call in my own life but but then on the other end of the spectrum, probably one of my favorite moments is right at the end of the last episode of of, uh, uh, of the season when the apostles come back and Jesus tells them, yeah, Jesus tells them, you know, <laughs> yeah. I have food that you know not of. And, and Andrew says, well, someone brought you food. And it's just, I laughed out loud, you know, and, and of course, like that's there in the yeah. gospels too, but you don't right. laugh at that when you encounter it in the gospels, yeah. but it's funny. And right. the way they play it, and, and I think that's a perfect example of, of, of not just the attention to de- detail, but then also the way they're able to take this material and render it in a very compelling way. Um, that's not easy to make that joke land and they make it land. And I was cracking up yeah. <laughs> and, and partly because I'm riding the high of this encounter with the woman at the well, which also is just such a climactic moment. It was great to put yeah. that at the end of the, the season. And so, so yeah, I'm so stoked for, for season two. It can't come soon enough. Just, um, just to make one final comment. I mean, it's really yeah. interesting that they chose to make Nicodemus such a major subplot yeah. this season. And I yeah. think a lot, to me, the way it functions is to really give a window into who the Pharisees are in a way that you don't necessarily understand just reading the gospel in isolation. Mm. Um, I mean, N.T. Wright does a good job of this in some of the stuff by him that I've yeah. read, his, his scripture scholarship as well. But um, yeah, it, it's it's because, because you get to see who they are at their best, right? Yeah. As well. Yeah. Um, not just as like the villains. And also, right. you know, some of the other Jews who follow Jesus are not necessarily the most educated. So w- when you get this window into the Pharisees and the religious life of the Jews, you really get – you kind of like get a window, a necessary window into the Jewish culture of the time that you might otherwise miss had they not made Nicodemus such a major subplot. Right. So I think it's it, it's really valuable in putting – um, in putting so much in, into perspective and showing how even with Nicodemus, who's so open to what's new, it's so difficult for him at the same time and, and seeing that all the more so for the others who reject, actually reject Christ. Yeah. Uh, because even Nicodemus can't like go all the way in terms of like the, um, maybe the call to, to follow the, the uh, evangelical councils in a complete, in a complete way. Yeah. Uh, so mm-hmm. I think that's a really great choice on their part to, to pick this character to yeah. expand because it allows us to see a whole world that we otherwise would be ignorant of. Josh, I wanted to just ask you because, you know, people might not know about the oratory. Um, can you explain really quickly what the oratory is? And also, are you, are you a seminarian technically right now or? Yeah. Um, so the, the oratory, it comes, uh, I mean, it means a place of prayer, the word, um, 
but it's a, a community of uh, secular priests, um, like you know, diocesan priests are, who live in community. So it's not a religious order technically. Um, technically, we are a society of apostolic life. So we don't take the three vows that that religious take. Um, but in a lot of ways, it is analogous to a religious community. Um, we follow the spirituality of our founder, St. Philip Neri, who founded the Oratory in the 16th century. He's one of the great counter-reformation saints and did so much to reform the city of Rome that he's known as the second apostle of Rome. Uh, famously, St. John Henry wow. Newman was an Oratorian as well, as was uh, St. Francis right. de Saul, who founded an Oratory in Thanon. Nobody talks about that except for Oratorians. Um, uh, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we have we have some some wonderful saints. There's a few others and, and some blesseds, but um, um, I am currently in seminary at St. Charles Borromeo Seminary for uh, here in Philadelphia and uh, doing my first year of pre theology. Well, God bless you. I know this has been a long journey for you to to get where you wanted to be. So that's really wonderful. Thank you, thank you very much. You said so. So when you say France, St. Francis de Sales, you're no doubt talking about St. Francis de Sales. Is that, is that who you're talking? Yes. The same, the same yes. person. Yes, the okay. same person. All right. Well, I've never heard it pronounced correctly before. So I was like, I, didn't, I had no idea he was an Oratorian. I had no idea he was an Oratorian. So that's that's very interesting. Is there any yeah. kind of centralized leadership, or is it just these individual mm-hmm. little? Yeah, every every community is independent. So some uh, an oratory might be very little, like another one, in in some sense. Um, so it's like anti English... kind of. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> it's like there's no central authority, but they're all like unique individual incarnations. Antifa of an doesn't idea. exist. It's just an idea. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, some oratories well, don't it, exist. <laughs> it, it, no, in, in a way, it's kind of like monasteries, how each monastery is independent. But there is there just just to avoid confusion, there is something that is also called the oratory, which has a centralized structure, and that's the French oratory which developed out of St. Philip's Oratory, but became centralized and so became its own thing. Um, St. John Eudes, or Eud, uh, St. John Eud, I think is the, the proper pronunciation, uh, who promoted devotion to the Sacred Great Immaculate Marian Hearts. Saint, right? um, yeah, yeah. He, was, he was a French Oratorian. So was Louis Bouillet, who was involved with the Second Vatican Council. Um, and then the hmm. uh, work on the liturgy, he was also a French Oratorian. All right, very cool. Well, thank you so much, Josh. We really, uh, we really enjoyed having this conversation to you. Would you be interested in coming back to, to discuss season two uh, when it comes out? I'd love to. Thank you so much for inviting me. This was a pleasure.